Hello, everybody, and welcome to Rightly Dividing the Word with R.K. Brown. I am R.K. Brown, and I am the adult Sunday school teacher and Wednesday night Bible teacher at Fatherland Baptist Church in Madison, Tennessee. Y'all come visit us. We'd love to have you. All right. I am picking up on the lesson that I did last week. I'm doing a continuance of it. There's so much in the Scripture about this. It's kind of shocking when you, when you really start looking into it. <clears throat> I've been meaning to do this for a long time, and I keep kind of putting it off because it's you know it's a subject that I know could bring me some persecution, and of course my flesh don't like persecution, but you know I need to do what the Lord wants done. He put it in His Word, so He wants it to be talked about. So I am talking about the men of Sodom. This is part two. Now, I showed you last week the definition of a reprobate. Now, the reason I'm talking about this again is because the Bible in Romans 1 talks about God giving them up to uncleanness. People that reject God, people that, <clears throat> you know, they sort of made for themselves idols. And, of course, you can do that in your mind, too. You don't have to make yourself a literal idol to bow down to. You can bow down to whatever idol you have in your mind, your money or whatever it is. You know, like I taught in church this morning, Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. You can't serve God and mammon. So you can have an idol of mammon. It doesn't have to be, you can have, a, you can have a, an idea about what God is that's contrary to the scripture, and you have made for yourself an idol. So, <coughs> excuse me. So when people <clears throat> worship idols or do any kind of thing like that, they reject God and replace him with something else, then their heart becomes darkened. God darkens their heart. And then the Bible says in Romans 1 that he gave them up to uncleanness, to, the, to the, defile themselves. He, he gave them up to do all kind of fornication, men with men, women with women, blah, blah, blah. And he gave them over to a reprobate mind. So, you know, when you say, I give up, like when you're working on something and you finally, you, you just can't do it, you're done with it. You give up. Well, God gave them up to uncleanness. You know, they had it in them sort of already because we all have a lot of wickedness in us. And these particular people kind of lean that way. <clears throat> but God gave them up to it because they rejected him. So now they are full blown men with men burning in their lust for one another. I was talking to my friend Kevin and we were talking about this and he said, yeah, you know, those guys that you see on the floats at the gay pride parades and stuff, they're gone. They're reprobate. They are not ever going to be saved. They cannot be saved. So a reprobate is somebody who, according to dictionary.com, the noun version is a depraved, unprincipled, or wicked person. The example is a drunken reprobate. Number two, a person rejected by God and beyond hope of salvation. Number three, an adjective, morally depraved, unprincipled, bad, Number four, rejected by God and beyond hope of salvation. Number five, verb used with object. Reprobate, or I'm sorry, reprobated, reprobating. So that's a verb form. To disapprove, condemn, or censure. Of God, in other words, when it refers to God, to reject a person as for sin, exclude from the number of the elect from salvation. <clears throat> so you see clearly that dictionary.com thinks that a reprobate is somebody who cannot be saved, somebody who's beyond hope of salvation. Well, dictionary.com got it right because the Bible in Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 30 says this, Reprobate silver shall men call them because the Lord hath rejected them. So it means to be rejected of God and beyond hope of salvation. And the sodomites are those who have been rejected of God and are beyond hope of salvation. And like I said last week, and I'm going to say this again, they are not sodomites because, or they are not rejected because they're sodomites. They're sodomites because they are rejected. The rejection came first. And therefore, I showed you in Romans chapter 1 that the you know, the righteousness of God is revealed through the gospel. This tie is kind of bothering me. The righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel, but the wrath of God is revealed from heaven on all unrighteousness, on men who practice unrighteousness. And the wrath of God is upon them. 
it's not going to turn away from them. When you see just a full-blown sodomite, somebody that is just burning in their lust for somebody of the same sex, and that's men and women, by the way, then they it is over for them. They're not going to be saved. Now, you can do with that what you want to, but you have to contend with the Bible. And I'm even going to deal with the objection. There is an objection that people bring up in the Bible, and I'm even going to deal with that. Okay? But now, let's go to Judges 19. Last week, if you will remember, if you were watching, I, <clears throat> I talked about the Sodom and Gomorrah story. Well, believe it or not, there is a story in Judges chapter 19 that is very similar. Now, what happens is this Levite... Levi is the tr one of the tribes of Israel. One of you know, actually, there were twelve tribes, and then the Levites were separated from the tribes, and they ministered to the Lord. They did all the you know the ministering in the tabernacle and all that sort of stuff. So, and then when the, when the temple was built in Jerusalem, they did all the ministering to God there in the temple. So, <clears throat> this Levite has a concubine or a live-in girlfriend, if you will. And they go into this city called Gibeah, which is a city of the Benjamites. Now, Benjamin is also a tribe of Israel. He was the 11th tribe. And he's not called Little Benjamin for nothing. And I'll tell you why in a minute. But let's read the story where the old man and his girlfriend or his concubine go into a town. And they're going to sleep in the street. But an old man comes out of the field and exhorts them to stay at his house. And we'll see why. <clears throat> and the old man... Then the old man said, Peace be with thee. However, let all thy wants be upon me, only lodge not in the street. So even though this is a city in Israel, this old man knew what was going on. He knew these wicked people were living here in this town of Gibeah. And he wanted to spare that man and his concubine from their evil doings. So he brought him into his house and gave provender unto the asses, and they washed their feet, and did eat and drink. Now as they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men of the city, certain sons of Belial, beset the house round about, <clears throat> and beat at the door, and spake to the master of the house, the old man, saying, Bring forth the men that came into thine house, that we may know him. Bring, I'm sorry, bring forth the man that came into thy house that we may know him. It's the same thing that happened in Sodom and Gomorrah when the angels <clears throat> came to Lot's house and the men of Sodom beat on that door and said, bring out those men that we may know them. Exactly the same thing. They wanted to have sexual, they wanted to have a sexual encounter with this man. <clears throat> and the man the master of the house went out unto them and said unto them, Nay, my brethren, nay, I pray you, do not so wickedly, seeing that this man is come under mine house. Do not this folly. So that man did the same thing as Lot. He called them his brethren. But at least in the case of this man, they were actually Israelites. So in a sense, they were, you know, physically, they were kin. They were part of that family you know, part of the family of Israel or Jacob. But <clears throat> they were sons of Belial, so they weren't his brothers because Jesus said, who is my brother and who is my mother and who are my sisters but they that do the will of the Father. So they were not his brothers, but he called them brothers. And at least he had sort of an excuse, like I said, as opposed to Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah when he called those men brethren and they were not at all in any way his brothers. Behold, here is my daughter, a maiden, and his concubine. Them will I bring out now, and humble ye them, and do with them what seemeth good unto you. But unto this man do not so vile a thing. So it's exactly the same thing as Sodom and Gomorrah. Now this old man knew the Sodom and Gomorrah story. The people of Israel knew that story. <clears throat> and this old man does a wicked thing just like Lot did. It's a very similar story because he was willing to offer up these females in order to, you know, protect the man that was coming into his house. I have a message here. I'm just going to make sure that it's not somebody telling me that I have no volume. Okay, I think we're good. Sorry, I had to, I had to look at my phone real close, but yeah, it's a blind man thing. 
I just want to make sure that nobody was telling me that I had like no audio or something like that. Okay, I see people are watching. So, okay, we're good. We're in good shape. So anyway, <clears throat> Lot did a wicked thing by offering up his virgin daughters. And this man did a wicked thing by offering up his virgin daughter and the man's concubine or his living girlfriend. Now, I said, I said jokingly, of course, to the men at church, I said, is there any man here among us that would offer his virgin daughters up to a bunch of sodomites to rip her apart? If there is, I'm coming out there. And of course, everybody laughed. But I mean, that's a wicked thing that that man did. But check this out. It gets worse. This is worse than the Sodom and Gomorrah story in a way. Check it out. But the men would not hearken to him. So the man took his concubine and brought her forth unto them. And they knew her and abused her all the night until the morning. And when the day began to spring, they let her go. So they knew her. They just had sex with her and they abused her. Now, remember that word abused because we're going to come back to that word whenever we get to the objection that the scripture that people use to try to object this doctrine that I'm talking about here, the reprobate doctrine as concerning sodomites. <clears throat> Verse 26. Then came the woman in the dawning of the day and fell down at the door of the man's house where her Lord was till it was light. And her Lord rose up in the morning and opened the doors of the house and went out to go his way. And behold, the woman, his concubine, was fallen down at the door of the house and her hands were upon the threshold. Her hands are upon the threshold. She can't even make it into the door, can't even knock on the door. And he said unto her, Up! Let us be going. But none answered. Then the man took her up upon his ass, and the man rose up and got him unto his place. Well, <clears throat> it turns out as the story goes, and I won't go into the whole story because there's a lot more to it, but I'll give you the general overview. It turns out that the woman was dead. They abused her so bad that she died. I dare not even try to speculate on what they might have done to her to cause her to die. But I'll, I'll never, I'm not even going to say it. I'm not even going to go there. So <clears throat> anyway, the woman is dead. So the man takes her body and hacks it into 12 pieces and puts one piece of her body on an ass and sends it and sends all 12 pieces into all 12 tribes of Israel. And the men of Israel question what's going on. And so they finally they, the man comes forward and they talk to him and he tells them what happened in Benjamin at Gibeah. And so the men go to Gibeah, the men of Israel, they gather themselves all together, kind of as one man. And they go to Gibeah and they tell the men of Gibeah, turn over these men to us and, and we'll, you know, we'll be cool. We'll kill them and that'll be that. But the men of Gibeah, the Benjamites, would not turn the men over to them. And so they got into three battles. The first day, the men of Benjamin destroyed many thousands of the men of Israel. The second day, the same thing happened. But the third day, they wept and fasted before the Lord. And the Lord hearkened unto them, and they almost completely destroyed the tribe of Benjamin. <clears throat> so much that there was only 600 men left out of a tribe of thousands. I think about 26,000 men were killed, and there was only 600 men left. And... So they did a thing to get them to get more wives, so that the so that the tribe would not completely be destroyed, because they killed their women and children and everything. They destroyed almost the whole tribe, and the only reason that they didn't kill those six hundred men is because they escaped into the mountains. So anyway, you know, the men of Israel wept over the fact that the tribe was almost destroyed, and so they they figured out a way to get wives to those men, and the tribe of Benjamin continued on until, you know, basically until seventy A.D essentially. And now, of course, all the tribes are mixed and mingled and scattered, and there is no genealogy. And so just like the Apostle Paul tells us not to worry about endless genealogies, well, that's one of the reasons why is because there's no way to trace that Jewish blood. So anyway, there's you a similar story to Sodom and Gomorrah, only in some ways worse. 
and even a tribe of Israel was almost destroyed because of it. Now, we're going to go to the book of Deuteronomy. Now, of course, I read to you last week where, you know, the Bible says if a man lay with mankind the way he lie with womankind, they both are an abomination, blah, blah, blah. I read that to you in, in Leviticus. But now we're going to go to Deuteronomy and see something that God says about the Sodomite. Now, at this point, I want to tell you that from here on in the Bible, the word Sodomite is used in a ubiquitous way. Now, if you don't know what ubiquitous means, I'll give you an example. In the South, we say, hey, let's go over to the store and get a Coke. Well, when you go to the store and you get a Coke, it could be an orange or a grape or a Dr. Pepper or a root beer or a Sprite or a Coke. It could be any one of those things, and we would call it all a Coke ubiquitously. In other parts of the country, they use the word pop. So they would say, let's go down, let's go down to the store and get us a pop. Right? I'm trying to do my northern accent, which is terrible. And uh, so they use the word pop in a ubiquitous uh, good night, in a ubiquitous way to represent soda pop. So my, my finger's on this button and I just put a little too much pressure on it and it engaged. So anyway, <clears throat> so we're gonna see the term sodomite used in a ubiquitous way in the next few bits of scripture. Pay real close attention to what I'm about to show you in Deuteronomy chapter. 23, verse 17. There shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel, nor a sodomite of the sons of Israel. So the daughters of Israel, <clears throat> some of them were whores, obviously, even some prostitutes getting paid for it, and some were sodomites. Now, some people will say it's a temple sodomite, but they didn't have that in the temple of God. They didn't have you know, temple-worshiping sodomites like they might have in Corinth or Ephesus or somewhere like that. <clears throat> so when he talks about sodomite, he's talking about the men, the homosexual men. All right? Now look at what he says in verse 18. Thou shalt not bring the hire of a whore or the price of a dog into the house of the Lord thy God for any vow, for even... Both these are abomination unto the Lord thy God. So he's saying, don't bring any money from a whore. Like, in other words, don't let a whore pay a vow at the temple, like because people paid their vows and, um, you know, they made vows to the Lord and they paid their vows. Well, he said, don't take the money from a whore. Don't take the hire of a whore into the temple, and don't take money from a sodomite into the temple, only he called the sodomite a dog. So let's read all this together. There shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel, nor a sodomite of the sons of Israel. Thou shalt not bring the hire of a whore, so we see a whore compared to a whore, of the pr of, or the price of a dog, the sodomite into the house of the Lord thy God for any vow, for even both these are abomination unto the Lord. So he calls there the sodomite a dog, right? I hope you all are clear on that. He's calling the sodomite a dog. Now, <clears throat> let me go show you what Jesus says about this in Matthew chapter 11. This is going to put a whole new meaning because remember, I just told you, I just showed you the sodomite is a dog. Jesus said, give, the, give not that which is holy unto the dogs. Now, it's interesting that he put the definite article in front of it. He didn't say unto dogs. He said unto the dogs. That means there is no other. And he's not talking about literal, you know, woof, woof animals. He's talking about sodomites because he said the dogs. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under, feet, under their feet and turn again and rend you. Don't give that which is holy unto the dogs. Now, Jesus, that, you know, some, some might say, you know, because we know that the Jews, are, you know, were rejected that, you know, that Israel, that Jerusalem was rejected, that Jesus said no fruit would ever grow on it again, that some might say, well, he's talking about the Jews or those Jews that rejected him. He's talking about the dogs, the sodomites, the definite article. It means there is no other. When you see the in front of something, it means there is no 
other. Jesus said, don't give that which is holy to them. They are reprobate. There is no need to preach the gospel to them. Now, this is probably the point where some of you might be bailing out and saying, man, I, I don't believe that that's true. Well, do what you will with it. Go back and watch my lesson from last week because I laid it out really well. This is only the second half, and there's still a lot more to go. What do we got here? I've kind of forgot my place here. Okay, I told you that the term sodomite would be used in a ubiquitous way to represent homosexuals in Israel. Now, yeah, obviously, we know that the, the real literal sodomites were the men of Sodom, as you see them called in Genesis 13, verse 13, which, incidentally enough, has 13 words in it. But they are, they are ubiquitously called sodomites if they're homosexuals in Israel, and so that's what I call them as well. I call them sodomites because that's a Bible term. I won't use any derogatory term. I might use the word queer because they use LGBTQ. So they use the word queer, but I won't use any, I won't use any derogatory terms that the Bible doesn't use or that they don't use themselves in the description of themselves. So I will call them sodomites. Anyway, now we're going to see the word used ubiquitously and watch this progression that goes on throughout the, the reign of these different kings in Israel. We're going to see that there were sodomites in the land, and then one king removed some of the sodomites, and then another king removed all the rest of the sodomites, and then another king removed the houses of the sodomites. We're going to see a progression here. In the days of Rehoboam, who was the son of Solomon, and Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord. This is, by the way, this is 1 Kings 14, 22. And Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins, which they had committed above all that their fathers had done. For they also built them high places and images and groves on every high hill and under every green tree. And there were also sodomites in the land, and they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. So we see that they did abominations in the land. There were sodomites there. All right, moving on. In the days of Asa, 1 Kings fifteen eleven, And Asa did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did David his father. And he took away the sodomites out of the land and removed all the idols that his father had made. So he did that which was right in the land unto the Lord. And one of the things he did that was right was he removed the houses of the sodomites. Make sure there's nothing wrong with my broadcast here. Nope. Okay. I think we're good. For some reason, I'm a little paranoid about it. I don't know why, but anyway, sometimes I've had weird situations where my, audio wasn't working right or something like that. So, you know, and my friend Kevin would text me and, and but I wouldn't know that I had gotten a text. And so I put my phone here beside me, but I, <laughs> I need to not look at my phone. I think it's okay that people are watching. I think it's okay. Anyway, we move on. In the days of Jehoshaphat. Now remember Asa, his father removed the Sodomites out of the land, but he didn't get them all because in the days of Jehoshaphat, 1 Kings twenty two forty five. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoshaphat and his might that he showed and how he warred, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? And the remnant of the Sodomites, which remained in the days of his father Asa, he took out of the land. So we see clearly that Asa took the Sodomites out of the land, but there were still some there. So... <clears throat> Jehoshaphat comes along and removes the rest of them. And we're going to talk about Jehoshaphat again at the end of the lesson. So, and we're going to see that the thing that was right in his eyes is that he removed the groves and the images and all that stuff. And of course, that was in the days of Asa, that was also part of what he removed. And so obviously Jehoshaphat removed all the same stuff that his father did. He finished the job that his father started. Now we'll see this. In the days of Josiah, and he break down the houses of the Sodomites that were by the house of the Lord, where the women wove hangings for the grove. 
So part of their idol worship was that they had a grove, and I guess supposedly they were able to go into this little grove of trees and conjure up spirits and things like that. So after the Sodomites were out of the land, then these women were using the houses of the Sodomites that had been by the temple where the Sodomites were living, and he destroyed their houses so the women didn't have any place to make these hangings anymore. So we see a progression that in the days of Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, there were sodomites in the land. In the days of Asa, he removed the sodomites out of the land, but not all of them because then Jehoshaphat, his son, comes along and removes the remnant of them or the rest of them. And then um, <clears throat> Josiah comes along somewhat later and removes the houses of the sodomites breaks them down, tears them down, where the women were making hangings for the grove. So you see that progression there where the sodomites were removed out of the land. But you see the term sodomite used in a ubiquitous term, and they got them out of Israel, and we should get them out of our lives as well. You know, we can't go around killing people, obviously, even though the Bible says they're worthy of death, not only in Leviticus, 18 in Leviticus 20, but also in Romans chapter 1, it says that those that do such things are worthy of death. So government should be taking care of it, not individuals. I'm not, you know, saying that there should be any kind of vigilanteism or any kind of thing like that. So now we move on. Let me see where I'm at because I've talked so much. I've kind of lost my place. I think I know where I'm at, but let me see. Okay. <clears throat> I actually did not know where I was. Now, we're going to move into the New Testament. We're going to go to 2 Peter chapter 2, where Peter is talking about false teachers who are reprobate, who are rejected, who bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them. So they're denying the Lord, and so they become rejected. They become reprobate, and Peter compares them to the angels that were cast out of heaven. He compares them to... <clears throat> uh, the people that died in the flood during the days of Noah, he compares them to the Sodomites. Every one of these were reprobate. Now, some say that there might have been people that were saved in the world, um, you know, dear, uh, other than, you know, even though they were destroyed in the flood. I, the Bible doesn't say you would have to you would have to make a speculation on that that the Bible doesn't say. The Bible said that they were destroyed, they were rejected, so I'm going to I'm going to say that they were rejected. So Noah and his family, Noah and seven other people were saved. The Bible compares the false teachers, I keep putting too much pressure on that button when I kind of dig in my finger, my other hand went down on that button. The Bible shows us where the false teachers are compared to sodomites, they're all reprobate. We're going to be reading about a bunch of different types of reprobates in this Next group of verses. Second Peter chapter 2. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. So we're talking about false teachers. We're not talking about Bible-believing teachers. And every one of us who teach the Bible, we don't have it perfect. We're not right about everything, although I am right about this. And go back and watch the video. I have used a lot of Scripture to prove my point. So... But, you know, none of us are right about everything. Nobody completely knows the Bible. So that's not a false teacher. A false teacher is somebody who is bringing in damnable heresy, who has gone over the edge, who is not a true Bible teacher, who is not a true Christian, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. That word pernicious is real similar to the word perdition. It has very similar meaning, kind of destruction, ruin, their ruinous ways, their destruction, their ways of destruction, their pernicious ways. And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of, and through covetous, covetousness they shall and through covetousness shall they with feigned words or false words make merchandise of you whose judgment now of a long time lingereth. God is just waiting to judge them, and their damnation slumbereth not. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, we're talking about the angels that were cast out of heaven, you'll see that in Revelation 12, but cast them down to hell 
and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. He brought in the flood on the world of the ungodly. These people were rejected. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overflow, overthrow, making them an ensample or example to those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for, for that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment. So you see clearly there that those false teachers are compared to the angels that fail, to the ungodly people that were destroyed in the flood, that were rejected by God because the world was the earth was filled with violence, and the cities of Sodom. So these are all reprobates. So the Sodom and Gomorrah people are compared to the false teachers. The false teachers are compared to Sodom and Gomorrah. They are lost. They're reprobate. They're not going to be saved. Their destruction slumbereth not. Okay? Now we go to Jude chapter 1 where we see essentially the same thing. Beloved, when I gave all diligence unto you, Oh, when I gave all, I'm sorry, good night, I'm not reading good tonight. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men creeped in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Or as it said in Second Peter chapter 2, denying the Lord that bought them. So we're talking about the same kind of people, that they're crept in unaware, that they crept in secretly, whose condemnation is of old. So they are condemned. Now, so we're talking about false teachers here, but check it out again, the same sort of thing. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. So he delivered all the people out of the hand of Pharaoh, but he destroyed the ones that didn't believe in the desert. Their bodies fell in the desert, and that's a type or shadow of, of us entering into the promised land. You must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So again, he's comparing the false teachers and the fallen angels and the children of Egypt now, or the children of Israel that didn't believe when they came out of Egypt. He's showing that they're all reprobate, that they're all rejected of God. And now, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange or queer flesh are set for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. That word strange, actually a synonym to strange is queer. So they were going after queer flesh, just like they call themselves LGBTQ or whatever it is. LG, whatever, you know, LGBTQ or something. And they, the Q stands for queer. And it literally, the literal definition of queer is strange. Look it up in a dictionary. It means strange. So when they're going after strange flesh, they're going after queer flesh and the Bible said that they are an example to those who would live afterwards. Because, like I said at the beginning of the lesson, they're not reprobate because they're homosexuals. They're homosexuals because they are reprobate. They're homosexuals because God hath rejected them and given them up to uncleanness, given them up to defile themselves with one another, given them over to a reprobate mind. So God gave them up to do those things. All right? 
So once again, we see where the sodomites are compared to false teachers. Now I'm going to deal with the objection in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I believe starting at verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous... By the way, this is the Apostle Paul talking. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkard, nor railers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God." Now, people will say effeminate and abusers of themselves of mankind. In fact, if you look in your NIV or your modern Bible version, it will say homosexuals. The word, the Greek phrase literally means man betters. But, you know, women are man betters too. Now, the reason, they, the reason I think they think like that is because it says effeminate nor abusers of themselves of mankind. So they put effeminate and abusers of themselves of mankind right next to it. Now, if it is people that lean that way, they're not going to stay that way because if, they, you know, if they're confused or whatever, or maybe they've experimented as a teenager because a lot of teenagers are doing that kind of thing these days. Because, you know, they're being taught in the schools that it's okay. So, you know, and their parents aren't teaching them any better. So if it's people who are dabbling in it, they're not going to stay in it. They're not going to continue to do it. But remember, I showed you in the uh, book of Judges in chapter 19. Let me see if I can find it there real quick. In chapter 19, where it said, But the men would not hearken unto him, so the man took his concubine and brought her forth unto them, and they knew her and abused her all the night until the morning. So they abused her. So if women are doing, you know, unseemly things with men, then, you know, they're being abused. And I guarantee you there are men that are abusing women. Abusers of themselves of mankind could very well be women. Now, here's the reason I say it. Go to 1 Timothy Chapter 1, verse 9, we're going to see the exact same Greek phrase rendered slightly differently in English. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners. Oh, I had two words stuck together there. Unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, and, or I'm sorry, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for manstealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. So look, look at the comparison here in verse 10. For whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind. Now what's the opposite of a whoremonger? A whore. So for whores and whoremongers is what he's saying. What I believe he's saying, it's the same phrase in Greek, man betters. It means man betters. And I believe in this case it's talking about females. So it may not be talking about homosexuals at all. But of course, your modern Bible will say that it's homosexuals so that they can have homosexuals in their churches and that sort of thing. But there ain't no place for homosexuals in our churches. They don't need to be there. They won't do anything but m confuse your children and molest your children because let me put out a statistic again. Homosexual, may okay, let me back up. Child molestation in this country and around the world consists almost entirely of men. It is almost non-existent among women. In other words, there's almost no women that molest children. It does happen, but it is so rare, it's almost non-existent. Men are the one that molest children. Sodomites are, basically sodomite males are approximately about 2% of our population, something like that, 2% in America, in the United States. They perpetrate 30% of the pedophilia that goes on in the United States. So 2% of the population perpetrates 30% of the pedophilia that goes on in the United States. So there is no way that you can find a, 
a sodomite that is not a pedophile. There ain't no way, not if 2% of people perpetrate 30% of the child molestation in America. They're all pedophiles. You don't want them in your church. If this gets me in Facebook jail, so be it. I am preaching the Bible. I have a right to practice my religion. I'm not using any derogatory terms. I'm just preaching the Bible. I'm practicing the Christian religion. So if you take me off of Facebook or YouTube and you put me in YouTube or Facebook jail, just remember this. You are taking me off because I'm practicing Christianity. All right? So that is my answer to the objection. Now, how are we supposed to deal with these people if they're reprobate, if God hates them? Because if they're reprobate, that means he has hated them. Jesus certainly died for them because, for instance, in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, the Bible said that Jesus tasted death for every man. So Jesus certainly died for their sins, but they have rejected God to the point where God has rejected them. It's not like the Calvinists say, a reprobate, oh man, I keep, keep putting my finger on these buttons. It's not like the Calvinist. <laughs> I'm just like digging in hard, I guess. Um, I need to take my hand off this keyboard. I know where I'm supposed to be next. Um, the Calvinist believe basically that everybody is a reprobate until they come to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that when men reject God, continually reject God, then God turns them over to a reprobate mind. The Calvinists believe that people are born reprobate. That is not true. That is a false doctrine. Go to Romans 1 and you'll see that God gave them over or gave them up to uncleanness, gave them up to defile themselves with one another, gave them over to a reprobate mind because they worshiped the creature rather than the creator. And their foolish heart was darkened. Okay? So how are we supposed to deal with them? Psalms 139 verse 19 this is David talking. Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men. For they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. Now, this is David talking. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee, and am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee. I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So after David says this, then he says, hey, search me. See if I'm not clean because my heart is right with you, Lord. Obviously, we know he wasn't perfect, but David was a man after God's own heart. David was willing to follow the Lord, even though he had that thing with Bathsheba. He never swerved from his faith in God. And he said, see if there be any unrighteousness in me after he said, I hate those that you hate, and I hate them with perfect hatred. The word, the word perfect in the Bible means complete. So he said, I hate them completely. Now, Jesus tells us, he says, you have heard that it hath been said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemy. Bless those that curse you. Do good to those that, perse you know, that persecute you and, and all that. We are supposed to love our enemies, and our enemies could even be those that are among our brethren. Like, for instance, if you know, there's, a, there's a guy at church that's a professional musician, or he used to be. He used to play for Crystal Gale. And if I hired him to come over and do some session work and I didn't pay him and I refused to pay him, I could be his enemy, although he's still my brother. I am supposed to love him. He's supposed to love me. Even if he has to separate from me to, you know, to cause me to repent, he is still supposed to love me because I am his brother. I am his enemy. People that don't reject God, even if they're our enemy, if they don't just out and out reject God, then... We are supposed to love them, even if they're not believers, if they just don't reject God, if they're, you know, because most people in the world are kind of neutral about God. They, they don't really hate God. They don't really love God because they don't know God. And a lot of people are hungry to hear the gospel. A lot of people are anxious to hear the gospel. And when they hear it, they receive it. They just don't know it yet. But there are people 
who even have heard the gospel and they hate it, they despise it, they reject it, and we are supposed to hate those that hate God. Want to see more proof? Check this out. I told you we would talk about Josiah again. Second Chronicles 19, verse 1. No, I'm sorry, Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem. That's weird how I had that I spaced in the wrong place. And Jehu, the son of Hanani the seer, went out to meet him and said unto, unto King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Now I'm going to stop here because I didn't give you the backstory. So I'm going to stop and give you the backstory, and then I'm going to read that again. The backstory is that Jehoshaphat aligned himself with Ahab, who was the king of northern Israel. Because if you've watched any of my lessons before, if you've watched like Jeroboam or the Great Divide or any of that kind of stuff, you will know that at some point after Solomon's death, his son Rehoboam lost 10 of the tribes to another king named Jeroboam. So Rehoboam ruled over two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, and Jeroboam ruled over 10 tribes. The 10 tribes are called Israel. The Two tribes were called Judah. Jehoshaphat is a king of Judah. Ahab was the king of Israel. And Ahab aligned himself with this wicked king. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Jehoshaphat aligned himself with this wicked king Ahab and went with him to fight a war as an ally. And Ahab gets killed. So when Jehoshaphat comes back into the city, uh, Jehu the seer comes to meet him and says this. Then Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Nevertheless, there are good things found in thee in that thou hast taken away the groves out of the land and has prepared thine heart to seek God. So when he took the groves out of the land, remember he also took out the Sodomites because his father Asa had taken out the Sodomites and the groves and all that stuff, but he didn't get it all done. And so his son Jehoshaphat comes along and finishes the job. So there was good found in him in that he took out the groves and along with the groves went the Sodomites, right? So that was the good found in him. But Jehu comes to him and says, should you love those that hate God? Well, the obvious implied answer is no. And because you did love those that hate God, the wrath of God is upon you from before the Lord. You have wrath on you. Nevertheless, there is good found in you because you got rid of the groves and the idols and the sodomites. So there is good found in you. So there is my lesson. That is a lesson on the men of Sodom. I hope I don't have to talk about this again for a long time because it's, it's a really an unpleasant subject to talk about. But that is my lesson. They are reprobate, which means, again, I'm going to give you the definition of reprobate just so there's no confusion. The dictionary.com number two definition is person rejected by God and beyond hope of salvation. The adjective rejected by God and be hope of salvation. Verb of God to reject a person as for sin, exclude from the number of the elect or from salvation. To exclude from salvation, to reject, that is a person that is beyond hope of salvation, and the homosexuals or the sodomites are reprobates. They are not savable. There's no need to preach the gospel to them because they cannot be saved. Do with that what you will. Report me on Facebook. Report me on YouTube. Do with that what you will. But I have told you the Bible truth, and I am allowed in America, at least for now, to practice my religion and I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to exhort you, if you're not a Christian, if you don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, put your faith in Him because the Bible in Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that's you and that's me. And the Bible says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So the wages of sin or the, the, the price that, is, that you get paid for your sin is death. But that's not just physical death. And it is certainly physical death, but not just physical death. Because in the book of Revelation in chapter 
20, verse 15, I believe it says uh, something to the effect of death and hell gave up their dead, and whoever's name was not found in, written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So the Bible talks about something called the second death. And if you have ever lied before, you may not have done any other sin, but you certainly have lied because the Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. Every man, every woman, every child, every boy, every girl is a liar. We all have lied. And the Bible says that all liars shall find their place in the lake of fire which is the second death. But Romans 5, 8 says that God commendeth his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, the righteous for the unrighteous. Christ died for us while we were sinners. It Actually, I mixed two scriptures there. And the Bible tells us, that salvation, remember I told you that the Bible said that all have uh, that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Well, salvation is a gift. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will not perish. And the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, it is by grace you are saved through faith and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So eternal life is the gift of God. Now, if I, you know, give you my cell phone here, it's on a stand. If I give you my cell phone here and I say, well, I'll give you this cell phone, but you got to give me a hundred bucks. Well, that's not a gift, is it? Or if I say, well, I'll give you this cell phone, but you got to come over to my house a couple of times and clean my house. Oh, well, that's not a gift, is it? Because you're working for it or you're paying for it. Or if I give you this phone and then I come back a couple of weeks later and say, hey, man, I've got to have that phone back. And I take it back from you. That's not a gift, is it? The Bible says that it is by grace you are saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Salvation is the gift of God and he's never going to take it from you. And it is eternal. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're hearing me, if you're believing what I'm saying to you, and if you really believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins. Now, I'm not just saying that believe a set of facts. I'm saying put your trust, whoever you are, put your name in front of whoever and say, I believe what you said, R.K., I believe the gospel. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And the Bible also says that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So I want to help you call on the name of the Lord right now. If you believe what I'm saying to you, this could be somewhere in the future. Today is uh, Sunday, January 13th, 2019, but you could be way off somewhere in years from now in the future watching this video and believe what I'm saying to you and you can pray with me and God will hear you call on the name of the Lord and pray like this. Lord Jesus, I believe what the Bible says, that you died for my sins. And I want to be saved, Lord. I don't want to go to hell. And I believe what R.K. said about the second death. I believe what the Bible says about the wages of sin being death and that there is a second death, which is the lake of fire. Lord, I don't want to go there. Have mercy on my soul. Save me, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed something like that and you meant it from the bottom of your heart, just like Philip said to the Ethiopian eunuch when the Ethiopian eunuch said, There is water. What doth hinder me from to be baptized? And he said, If you believe with all your heart. And he said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. If you believe the gospel that Jesus Christ died on the cross and shed his blood for your sins, was buried and rose the third day, guaranteeing that if Jesus rose from the dead, that if God raised him from the dead, that he will also raise us from the dead who believe the message, the gospel message, who put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you believe that, then you are a saved person. I am the Sunday school, adult Sunday school teacher and Wednesday night Bible teacher at Fatherland Baptist Church. Come and join us at Father Lender. Find yourself a King James Only Bible Believing Church somewhere. Also, if you're watching by Facebook and or YouTube, then do as the kids say and smash the like button. And if you're watching by YouTube, then hit the subscribe button and the bell so that you can be notified every time I put up a message like this. 
I am R.K. Brown. This is Rightly Dividing the Word with R.K. Brown. I'm glad that you were with me tonight. I'm going to be out next week on the 20th, but I'll be back after that, Lord willing. So have a blessed week. God go with you wherever you go. Be filled with the Holy Ghost and witness to people if you're a Christian. Good night.